The scripture today is from a New Revised Standard Version, the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 7, located on page 4 of the New Testament in the Pew Bible. Hear the word of the Lord. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. The word of the Lord. Oh, I hope that one day, one day I might be that good. I don't know about you in your life, but I am grateful for that scripture. I'm grateful for mercy in my life, and I hope you're grateful for mercy in yours as well. And you know, as a, as a, a purely theoretical concept, mercy sounds like a really good idea, doesn't it? I mean, even those who might reject Jesus Christ as Lord are impressed with those words of Jesus. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. The problem comes when we find ourselves in situations where we are actually required to implement those words. Approving of mercy and actually showing mercy are two very different matters. And I think one of the reasons that we struggle with this is because needing to show mercy presupposes that a real debt is owed. You see, I don't have a problem with mercy if I'm the one on the receiving end. I really like it then. It's when I'm the one who's required to show mercy that I struggle. Because the only kind of person to whom I can show mercy is the one who does not deserve it. And Jesus, I think, illustrated this principle in a parable that's found in Matthew's Gospel in Matthew 18. The parable tells the story of a king whose servant owed him an impossibly large sum of money. And when the king called in the debt, the servant begged and begged for patience and and asked the king if he would please give him more time to repay the debt. Well, this desperate request was really just as impossible as the debt itself because it would have taken several lifetimes to acquire the amount that he owed. In fact, according to Scripture, the amount was so great it would have taken about 165,000 lifetimes. That's how big the amount was. Now, the king, of course knew the hopelessness of the servant situation. So instead of giving him more time to repay, which was impossible anyway, or making the servant pay the debt with his life, the king showed mercy and canceled the debt. Now, it would have been really nice if that was the end of the story, but it wasn't. Jesus goes on to say that no sooner had that forgiven servant gone out of the king's presence when he found a fellow servant who owed him a debt and that forgiven servant grabbed that fellow servant who owed him some money, grabbed him by the neck, choking him, saying, pay me what you owe me. His fellow servant, of course, fell to his knees and begged him, please be patient with me and I'll pay you back. The very words that the forgiven servant had just used with the king when he had pleaded for more time to pay back his impossibly large debt. But the irony is lost on him. The forgiven servant had his colleague thrown in prison. And Jesus said, when the other servants who were around saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and told the master everything that had happened. And then the master called that forgiven servant in and said, you wicked servant, I canceled all of your debt because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Now the obvious question that comes to mind when we hear this story is why the forgiven servant couldn't see the hypocrisy of his behavior? The answer is a simple one. I mean, he had a legitimate complaint against the other man. He wasn't trying to steal something from the servant that didn't belong to him. The other man really did owe him the money, and it wasn't an insignificant amount. It was about 100 days' worth of wages. And presumably, 
the debtor had agreed to pay back the money, but perhaps this guy was just a deadbeat. This is precisely the problem with mercy. You see, there's only one kind of person to whom you and I can show mercy. It's the person who does not deserve it. Period. There's a story that's told of a mother who came to Napoleon on behalf of her son who was about to be executed. And the mother asked the ruler to issue a pardon on behalf of her son, but Napoleon pointed out that it was the man's second offense and justice demanded death. I don't ask for justice, the woman said. I am pleading for mercy. And the emperor objected, saying, but your son doesn't deserve mercy. Sir, the mother replied, it would not be mercy if he deserved it. And mercy is all I ask. Her son was granted the pardon. Because mercy can only be granted to those who don't deserve it, it is easier to accept than it is to give. You see, when I experience mercy, I know that I've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. We accept God's grace because we all, every single one of us here, we know that we are sinners, and that's our only hope to have been granted mercy. But what happens when someone sins against us? How do we respond when someone says something behind our back Or when someone takes advantage of us? How do we feel when we do something for someone, for instance, and they never thank us? And what about the person who treats us cruelly? And now suppose that person is a fellow member of the church and claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Well, I want to ask for your mercy right now. Because undoubtedly, there will be times, if, if not already have happened, that I may have hurt you. I may have said something. I may have done something that I may not have even realized. But it may have hurt you. And I apologize for that, and I ask for your mercy. And I hope that we'll grant each other that as followers of Jesus Christ, as brothers and sisters. Because we all need mercy. You know, as Christians, we're, we're very comfortable with the language of grace. It's a part of our vocabulary. The, the nomenclature of grace is embedded in our hymnody. We sing, only a sinner saved by grace, or amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. We say these things about ourselves and we we feel good about it. We enjoy the experience of God's grace. But it can be a very different story when it comes to showing that same grace to each other. You see, it's one thing to sing about a wretch. It's something else to have to worship with a person right next to you who acts like a wretch each and every day. So while we sing about grace, what we practice in many cases is very, very different. You see, we rush out of the king's presence. We rush out of the king's presence with those words of absolution still ringing in our ears. And we find that fellow servant who owes us and we grab him by the neck and begin to throttle him, crying out, pay me what you owe me. Maybe there is a person who feels slighted by the chairman of the committee and resigns saying that she's too busy to continue to serve. There's the person who slips out the side door week after week after the service rather than have to go greet the person who offended him a month ago. There are a thousand whispers, a thousand slights, each one prompted by a genuine offense received at the hands of a fellow brother or sister in Christ. You see, it's not that we despise the notion of mercy. I mean, how could we? But we also realize that mercy is not something that comes naturally to us because real debt is extremely hard 
to forgive. Now, mercy also assumes that the debt that is owed has been canceled. And the clue to seeing this is found in the very nature of the blessing that Jesus pronounces in the Beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, Jesus says, for they will be shown mercy. So what are we to make of this? We, we, we might be actually tempted to understand Jesus' promise as simply a sort of a statement of mutuality in human relationships. I mean, what if Jesus is just sort of laying down a basic principle of politeness? Perhaps, perhaps all he means by this is, if you show others mercy, they'll show mercy to you. Maybe this beatitude is Jesus' version of that very folksy principle, just a variation of what your mother taught you when she sent you off to school. If you're nice to others, they'll be nice to you. The trouble with that advice is that it only took about five minutes to find out she was wrong. <laughs> sure, there were some kids who, who were nice to you if you were nice to them. But there was also that bully who stole your lunch. You could be nice to him all day long, but he'd still take your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It's good to be nice to people. But you know as well as I know that it's no guarantee that they're going to be nice to you. And the same is true when it comes to mercy. Just because you extend mercy to someone else does not necessarily mean they will extend that same mercy to you. They might even take advantage of you, which is precisely why it's so difficult to extend mercy in the first place. I mean, what is it that keeps us from abandoning ourselves to this grace that Jesus talks about in this beatitude and in so many other places? Why do we keep accounts of the offenses committed against us, and then we compound interest daily on those debts. Is it because we, we don't really understand mercy? Perhaps. Or maybe, and probably, it's because we really do understand mercy. Perhaps we're reluctant, reluctant because we realize that if we respond in the way that Jesus is describing in the scriptures, that we're going to have to cancel the debt. If we behave like Jesus teaches us, we are actually going to have to suffer loss. Our debtor is going to get away without ever having to pay for what he or she has done. And there is something deep within us that recoils at that thought. You see, there is deeply ingrained in the human heart an innate hunger for justice. It is a vestige of the image of God imprinted on our nature. Now, it's true that it's a longing that has been distorted by sin, and yet it still remains there, this sort of smoking ember in the midst of the ruin to remind us that there is an account that needs to be settled. C.S. Lewis calls this, calls this the rule of fair play or the moral law. And he says it is most evident when people are arguing. When people are quarreling, Lewis writes, they say things like this. Well, how would you like it if somebody did that to you? Or things like, that's my seat. I was there first. Lewis writes this, so there is in us this innate thirst for justice. And we also know the price for violating the law of fair play. That too is imprinted on our souls. It is the fundamental law of all debt. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But here is where things start to break down for us. You see, I can call in your debt against me, but I have debts of my own. If I ask the judge to pronounce sentence on you, then I convict myself. And this is the fundamental dilemma that Jesus is addressing in this beatitude. On the other hand, if I show mercy, I relinquish my claim 
and I risk suffering loss. Truthfully, I don't want either option. And that's why there's no mercy without grace. There's no real mercy without God. More specifically, there's no mercy without Jesus. Here, the blessing is the same as the condition. The merciful are shown mercy. Now, in the Beatitudes that have preceded this one, the condition is the antithesis of the blessing. The poor in spirit are given the kingdom of God. Those who mourn are comforted. The meek inherit the earth. Those who are hungry are filled. In other words, the blessing answers the need. But mercy stands as both the blessing and the need. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm reluctant to show you mercy because I can't bring myself to let go of what is owed me. But if I call in your debt, what happens is I put myself in a position where my debts too are brought to light. Now sometimes I, I deal with this dilemma by trying to have it both ways. I re resort to a kind of counterfeit mercy. So I might minimize the debt and say, oh, it was nothing, it doesn't matter, I'm bigger than that. But all the while, I've got this inner accountant who's keeping track. Interest on that debt is being compounded. And I know exactly how much is owed me. Or maybe I might try to stretch out the payments. I give those who have offended me a, a pass for the day. But I assure you, someday payment will come. It's like the woman I met who was in her 60s who felt embittered by things her younger sister had done to her. And yet she had never said a word to her sister, but instead had kept a record for herself. She told me, I've written down everything she's done to me, and I put it in my safety deposit box with instructions that it be given to her when I die. We might be willing to negotiate the terms of what is owed us, but cancel that debt altogether? Wipe it clean? I don't think so. The debt incurred by that person who has offended me is very real, and deep, deep within my soul there is a voice crying out, Somebody's got to pay for this! You see, ever since the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we have been hardwired to blame. To blame. Blame comes much more naturally than does apology. The truth is, we know the language of blame all too well, and friends, we need an antidote. We need a, a force that is powerful enough to break the cycle of resentment. Jesus gives to us that antidote in this beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. The only force that is powerful enough to break this deadly cycle of bitterness is the mercy of God. Rene Girard is uh, the head of the anthropology at Stanford University. And he studied the nature of culture for many years. In the course of his research, Gerard made a discovery that astonished him. He learned that the very things that destroy a culture are ingrained in human nature. Things that we know about as followers of Jesus Christ. Things like selfishness, violence, greed. Things that we Christians would call sin. But more amazingly... Gerard found that the thing that actually holds a culture together is something called a scapegoat. Can you believe it? Everybody, every culture he discovered, needs somebody to blame. And Gerard found this principle deeply embedded in every culture he examined. 
And of course, when he came to the culture of the Old Testament, he found the principle of the scapegoat acted out in Leviticus 16, where the priest confesses Israel's sins over a literal scapegoat and drives that goat into the desert. As Gerard read on into the New Testament, he discovered something even more incredible. In the New Testament, the scapegoat actually has a name. What was symbolized in the law of Moses is personified in the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the ultimate scapegoat. He is God's son who in Hebrews 9 says was offered once to bear the sins of many. You see, in Jesus Christ, the debts that we owe and the debts that others owe us They're all reconciled. Jesus is actually God's way of saying to you and to me, it's your fault, but blame me. And it is our fault. But God takes that for us on our behalf and forgives it all. Because of this great mercy of God and Jesus, that is what allows us to be merciful in our life. Because of what Jesus did for you and for me, we can now show mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. I mentioned that I spent most of this week in Orlando, and I I can't help but wonder how different this week would have been if that Orlando shooter had been taught mercy and love rather than vengeance, hate, and intolerance. If only he had known the Jesus who said these words about mercy. If only one follower of Jesus Christ, one church of Jesus, had been that example of mercy and love for him, it may have been a very, very different week. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Amen.